welcome to Performance Anxiety, proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pamela Stickney is our guest this week. Who is Pamela Stickney, you may ask? She's a virtuoso on the theremin. She's so good, in fact, that Bob Moog asked her to help him design his version of the theremin. She tells us how she began playing the instrument, what affects it when you play, like being licked by a puppy, and since she moved to Austria, how to travel with it. She also talks about taking this wild, futuristic instrument that's been the soundtrack to countless sci-fi movies into new territories by using effects pedals and other tricks. She's also played with some amazing artists like Yoko Ono, David Byrne, Bela Fleck, and a lot more. You guys have to check out her website, PamelaStickney.com. There are all kinds of clips and information there, including a link to her Facebook page. And explore her SoundCloud page at SoundCloud.com slash Pamelia. Check out our socials at Performance ANX or Performance Anxiety on Facebook. Give us a review. Might get read on a show if it's five stars. Now we're going to ring you, Pamela Stickney. Okay, I have to say my name, like, um, this is Pamela Stickney, um, I, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be spending the next hour chattering, or sometimes I call it Pam-splaining, <laughs> talking about what in the world it is I'm doing with this thing with antennas on it, it's kind of like tuning a TV without touching anything, and, <laughs> and then, <laughs> Luckily, there's not a clap track. <laughs> like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> That's fine. That's on the spot. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a swig of water here, I guess. Well, I've got some nasty apple cider vinegar in water. Oh, wow. Ooh, I got okay. antioxidant cocoa fusion. Cocoa fusion? That sounds it's... like a style of music. <laughs> it's like Caribbean uh-huh. fusion jazz. Like... <laughs> That's awesome. So <laughs> Brown's like doing all these, like, you know, like odd meter riffs. Like... Hey. <laughs> that would be that so would... hilarious. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! I think I think we just developed something here. Someone's got to go make that. <laughs> exactly. All right. That's any any listeners who can actually play music work on Coco Fusion. Oh, so, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I really do appreciate this. This is so cool. So, uh. I don't even know really where to begin. So let's let's start at the very beginning because I'm sure theremin is not where you got your musical start. So what what did you begin playing and, and was your family very musical? Did they you know did they have you playing uh, an instrument at an early age? How did you get started in music? Well, the, I mean, there's always the, my mom. She played piano as a hobby at home, so there was a piano around the house and. Okay. Uh, and the, and the, I I jumped on that thing. It was like the 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 longest lasting, lifelong lasting toy for me. <laughs> <laughs> so did you take lessons on the piano? Was it something that you wanted to do maybe professionally at some point? Well, when I was really really little, it was just a, a toy for me, really, and um and. Um, I, when I was about seven, then, um, you know, my parents, uh, they were advised, oh, you, she should take piano lessons, and, and it was really boring. <laughs> and after a year, my dad, I he, I know that he, <laughs> we didn't have much money, so he was asking me, like, do you still want to take piano lessons? I was like, no. He's like, oh, good, because I don't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank God for the the boringness of piano, I guess. Well, that's just mind numbing. So, yeah. So it's like you know things like that, 
because already I was playing things by ear. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, well, she should take formal lessons and learn how to read. And, and But I think with music, it's just like language. You learn how to speak first and interact speaking before you learn to read. <laughs> Otherwise, you might learn how to read phonetically, but you're not going to know what you're reading. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting point. That's really cool. So at that point, you're, you're playing piano, you're not taking lessons anymore and is there still music are you still playing piano for a while um did you were you studying other types of music the, um well i wasn't studying types of music i, I memorized my mom's repertoire and you know she helped me just because my hands are really small just to figure out you know fingerings that could work for my hands when okay. i was getting around and I liked what I, you know, I wasn't exposed to that much. All I heard was what was on the radio and what my mom practiced. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I was interested in what I was hearing. Okay. Okay. And, and at what point did music become what you wanted to do? Or was it always what you wanted to do? Well, it's always been something I, I, I have an interest in and enjoy doing, and the time just flies by with it. And and the, um, I never, it wasn't ever like, a, you know, as a kid, it's not like I sat there and said, I'm going to make a living doing music. I knew that I wanted to always uh, keep playing. And, okay. uh, um, and yeah, I just wanted to keep playing it. That was all. <laughs> so how did you find the theremin? Um, that is so by accident, um, I was, uh, I was back in like 97 and, um, I was playing in this band called Gegita and, um, my boyfriend at the time who was a member, uh, you know, he went out to Blockbuster Video to get a film for us to watch for the night. Okay. <laughs> and he's like, Henry, I'm like, oh. Fuck. I don't want to watch a documentary. Yeah. <laughs> fuck. Yeah, so I wasn't at all confused to watch a documentary about what's a theremin? Who gives a shit? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I remembered that, like, you know, that it was some time before that that some friends of his were like, oh, yeah, we saw this documentary, and, like, there's this instrument, called, and we think that you'd really do it. Like, we think you could do it, you know? And it's like, and they tried to describe it to me made no sense and I, I didn't pay attention to what they were trying to say because like uh-huh okay whatever because yeah. I was very scared then you know and I was happy with that you know it's fine for me and um and then I, like within the first few minutes of the documentary I was totally tucked in and very interested and um and it made sense when I heard and saw Clara um and so then, you know, I've explored many instruments already at that point. And, um, and so when I saw that, I just thought, ooh, I gotta try that. And it's like, a, like any other instrument that I've tried, I'd see someone play it. And, and when I was a small child, I always wanted to play a string instrument. You know, the only one I knew the name of was violin. I'd see that on TV mm -hmm. and it made sense to me and I had a feeling that I would understand um, how to play it. And it wasn't until I was 12 that I finally got to have access to a violin. Oh, wow. And then I played it. <laughs> nice. And so it was kind of that same curiosity, like, ooh, I want to try that. And and th there's some instruments I tried and, and didn't work for me, and, you know, you know like brass instruments. That, that was hell, and I had braces when I tried that, too. So, like, okay, screw that. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. Too much pain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've gone through that with my kids. They, they all play brass. My daughter plays the trumpet. My son, well, my oldest daughter plays the trumpet. My son plays the tuba. And my youngest plays the French horn. No way. you got, like, all, like, horn section there in the house. Oh, my house is the biggest cacophony. It's insane. And my son, <laughs> my son is... is He's taller than me, which is not a hard thing to to accomplish. I mean, I'm I'm a short guy, I'm like five six, but he's taller than me. But he's like soaking wet. He's like a buck twenty, so he's carrying this 
big ass. Uh, he played the sousaphone in marching band. Oh yeah! <laughs> so it's it's just amazing. You see this like the stick walking this enormous piece of brass around the stadium. It's crazy. <laughs> Oh my gosh, marching band. Oh, uh, that's all, so cool. All three of them are in high school. All three of them are in the marching band, so. Nice. I love marching band. Oh, they, they <laughs> love it. not have to do um, PE. Like, if marching band counted as, like, physical <laughs> education. Oh. But the downside show up on the field at, like, you know, 5.30 in the morning and they crack a dawn. Yeah. But, but all the rebounds were there, you know, like, the, all the uncool and then the flag team that was even more rejects than you know that was lower level than band you know so <laughs> yeah. <we should>. and <laughs> so there's like a bunch of rejects out you know I, but <laughs> that, want to do physical education yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but that's how they all find each other <laughs> uh, so all right so you see this documentary and it intrigues you where did you find a Moog? A Moog. I'm reading my notes here. I'm looking at. I'm, I'm looking at the Moog. He, <laughs> nope. Part of my notes. Where did you find a theremin to try to experiment with? Well, that took a while because I remember I lived in LA at that time, and uh, um, and my boyfriend he was already into like you know vintage uh, synthesizers. <laughs> they were just beginning to be called vintage then. They weren't <laughs> yet really cool, you know. <laughs> where you could find a mini mode for like a hundred bucks at a yard sale, you know? Wow. <laughs> like, those days. <laughs> Man. Nobody knew what it was. Like, someone have like one of those Casio, you know, SH-101 and like, oh, it's broken, you know, and you look at it and it's like, it's only because they had all of the, all of the knobs all the way down, like the start stop <laughs> frequency and no sound came out. And then it's just like, oh, 15, how about 10? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this piece of junk off your hands. But uh, there was a shop called Black Market Music, and and sometimes they might might have had a theorem in there. And so I went, but they didn't have one. Um, and then there was some, you know, some other shop that had, you know, antiques. And they had one that was like, you know, seven thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm glad I go there to try it out because, you know, it was an RCA and an RCA in comparison to one of Moog's instruments is a piece of shit. Like yeah. if I tried something and it was a piece of shit and and it couldn't be calibrated correctly and with gummy response, then I probably would have just thought it was a toy and like, okay, never mind. Yeah. Um, but um, by chance, we had a magazine lying around um, that was uh, like the, the Beastie Boys had this magazine called Grand Royal. Okay. And okay. there was an interview with Bob Moog in there, like several pages long. Oh, wow. And, and then, you know, since they had an interview with him, then there was like a little app spot for his company that was called Big Briar. The theremin kits and theremin, you know, the basic small size ones. Right. And so then it's like, oh my gosh, you know what? Let's just buy one, you know, screw it. You know, it's it's like buying a guitar and just see what happens. And uh, and so I just remember the mile marker was, there was a UPS strike and, um, and Princess Di died. So that was the time marker of when when I was waiting for that theremin to come oh, in the mail. Wow, jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how how does a theremin actually work? What is I know it's it's a magnetic field kind of a thing. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not good at the, the it's weird. I, I I'm good at the observational part of how it responds. Right. You know. And, and that's how I learned to deal with the thing. And so what I could understand of it was the, the sensitivity to any tiny movement of my body. Um, it, there were only four knobs on the instrument that I got. You know, one said pitch, the other volume, and then waveform and uh, brightness. 
And okay. so, uh, you know, I already was familiar with synthesizers, and this was just like a really bonehead, you know, not that many options. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, you know, what's left to do is listen to how it's responding. And the, I, I made the, you know, I made this amazing bonehead discovery when I pulled it out of the box, you know, plugged the antennas in, plugged it up to electricity, stuck it, you know, power, you know plugged it into an amp, and sat it on a coffee table and nothing came out. And so I was like, oh shit, it's broken, got a defected one. <laughs> and then I lifted the thing up off the table and suddenly the noise came out. And then it was like, lesson number one. Oh yes, the volume antenna was too close to the table and that's what kept it silent. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> And, uh, and so, um, you know, I then, uh, you know, figured out, because I, I knew it would be possible to play a melody on this thing, and so figuring out how to calibrate it, um, that means to to adjust the, the range of the, pitch range of the instrument, let's say. Okay. Um, it's uh, you've got to turn the pitch knob and adjust it so that you know it's like a stringed instrument and that the closer you get to the antenna the smaller distances and movements you're going to make with your pitch hand it, so it's like a string okay. instrument so you're lower and wider apart and so to get it in a, you know kind of a vocal range and uh, you know i had the memory in mind of what it looked like uh, um the distances that clara's fingers were moving Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was kind of at least, you know, the, the, you know, the basis that I had to work from and then just working with my ears, like, okay, this is how it goes. And it, and it didn't feel so comfortable when I was first playing it. And then I figured out, oh, wait a minute. Um, I'm, I play string instruments and I'm left handed, but I play string instruments the right handed way in which the pitch control is with your left hand. Okay. And your going is with the right hand. So I just turned the instrument around and suddenly it felt completely comfortable. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, so sometimes people don't realize that, you know, a, a good thing you can try doing if you're having a difficulty with the coordination, um, you know, you got to think about the hand you write with and the very fine motor skills that are necessary to write. Right. You know, they're very tiny, tiny movements, and that's really important for controlling the pitch, if that's your concern with how you're dealing with the instrument. My son has decided he wants to wash something outside, and he's making a racket. <laughs> I'm trying to tell him, be quiet. <laughs> I'm doing fine motor skills with my hands. At this point. He's a fine motor skill. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man, I swear. Sometimes it's like hey, whatever you say goes in one ear and out the other. Be quiet. I'm recording. Okay, I'll go outside and mow the lawn. Normally, that'd be great. Today, not don't. Not so much. Don't. Why am I? <laughs> Actually, he's cleaning the lawnmower. Oh, I don't know. I give up. Hey, that's uh, great. He's cleaning the lawnmower. I mean, sh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, okay. I'm the, great. <laughs> exactly. He's he, I got some power washing on that side of the house and needs to get done too. So the theremin is, just, to me, it's, it's fascinating because the very first thing I think of when I hear the word theremin is Jimmy Page. I just think of him using that and, and watching him on the Song Remains the Same movie, playing it and, and doing these, these weird, you know, gesticulations while this box of noise is going, woo, 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 woo. And I'm like, what in the fuck is he doing? What is, that's not his guitar. What is he? And it, it, then I started looking into it a little bit and then it's, you know, everybody else knows it from the sci-fi movies from the 50s and 60s that making the uh, sound effects for UFOs. And, but I was blown away because that's and, and it's literally up until the time I sent you an email to come on the show, that was basically all I associated with the theremin. And then I, wow. I started, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. So then I started researching for this and, you take something that to me that kind of sounds like 
of somebody playing a bowed saw and turn it into music. I mean, you make you can make it sound like a, a bass, like a stand-up bass. I and mean, it's amazing what you do with this thing. <laughs> well, in in a in a video that I saw, you said that you're playing the silence. Can you can you explain? That? I I I I figured it out when you when you were saying it in in the video. But you know, since nobody's watching the video at this time, hopefully they're listening to this podcast. What do you mean by with a the theremin? You, you're playing the silence. Um, because that's the only way that you're going to separate the notes and create the illusion of there being a separation between the notes is playing the silence. If you leave your volume hand up, it's just going... Right. But when you're playing the silence, you're going to... You know, the silence is what gives the separation between between the notes and you can create you can create the illusion of... Um, of uh, I guess it's like puppeteering, sort of. You know, it's animating. That animating. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of that. That's true. Yeah, because you're you're using your hands like almost like a marionette. Well, also when you see animation, it's a bunch of stop, start, stop, start. Yeah. And so you're kind of manipulating the stop, start. <laughs> okay, so so you bring up uh, another question that I had for you. In, in watching people play the theremin, obviously the movement affects sound but does the shape of your hand affect the sound like if you're doing whether your hands either on the the pitch control or the volume if is it going to sound different if you have a flat hand as opposed to a, a fist what affects the sound body wise okay well it's more the pitch is getting affected and okay um so i i stand super super still with my body as still as possible and um and say you know a very tiny movement towards or away from the pitch antenna that's standing upright um is going to have an effect on the the pitch going higher or lower or you and um and say it's not working just on the distance between you and that antenna but by how much mass is going into that field so i like to think of it like when there's that displacement idea when there's a tub of water mm -hmm. and if you step in or just dip your toes in it the water is not moving so much but if you stick your whole foot in or a whole leg and you're moving so much more of the water and so you know that's the reason why even though you could be the closest um you know body next to the theremin if while you're playing someone else starts to walk up from behind or in towards your field the the pitch is going to start to rise because that's uh, that's another person stepping into the pool oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and the more people come and approach towards it then that then increases the spaces between all of the notes that you're playing. So it's like someone is um, changing, the, you know, turning the knobs on your stringed instrument while you're trying to play it. Oh, wow. So is it going to change depending on the stature of the person? So if, if you've got one theremin and you're playing it and then you step away and then let's say, um, I don't know, a, an NFL linebacker comes up and decides to try to play it, is, is it going to sound different because of the mass of it'll be it'll be the measurement you know of the distance that he would have to move to go between two of the same notes that I would be moving towards and from uh, would be wider because he has more body mass so if somebody weighs uh, more than me, 
then uh, then they'll have to or more or less they'll depending on their preference too as well because no two people have the same distance preferences for for what's comfortable for playing it okay. um you really have to adjust it and, and sometimes when the machine's been on for a while it drifts so you have to take that into account but also wow. you're never standing in the same exact posture and place before the instrument so you know if you if i move the weight of my body towards the front of my feet that's going to change the calibration wow my whole body is a big piece of mass that's going into that tank of water <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how how wide is the field that uh, that will affect the thermostat. So how, like, how far do, do people need to be away from it in order not to affect it? Well, if they don't move at all, then that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can be closer or far. Although, if you're too close to a lot of, uh, you know, mass that conducts electricity, like human bodies, then, 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 um, then you might have this phenomenon where it's not possible to have shorter distances between your nodes nor can you have all of the octaves that range that you're accustomed to. Uh But, um, you know, so if I'm standing next to some wall that's made of some material that that conducts electricity, that has water in it or whatever, like even I was playing next to a big tree and the branches above me when the wind blew and the branches move, all the water that's in the branches is having an effect on the pitch of the theremin. Oh, wow. People think trees are dry, but they're full of water inside. <laughs> yeah, that's so. You, if you're playing, you have to really pay attention to where you're you're setting up on on a stage or in a room. Yeah, but well, since you know, I make sure that nobody's too close to my pitch antenna, and you, you don't always have control. You know, if you're playing in a tiny space and a little tiny stage, you know, I try to find a spot where. So there will be the least amount of movement, um, you know, or interference, or people walking by to go to the toilet. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a lot of, um, uh, you know, letting go and to, and, and just kind of, you kind of have to improvise it each time with, with each setting that you land in, because there are a lot of factors that you have no complete control over. <laughs> oh wow! So does other electrical equipment affect it? Like, uh, like if you're playing with somebody who's playing a guitar or something, or if you're playing next to a lamp, I don't, would would would, some, would things like that affect it? No, it's more sometimes to do with like the power source, you know, and okay. the, and also you know there've been times where you know I'll be sound checking and. And if somebody is plugging in the cables and the DI boxes, then it'll make little pitch jumps happen on my instrument. Oh. Or sometimes being, a, you know, next to the drummer and not so far from them. Uh, when I've had moments where the person, you know, will touch their cymbal to silence it. And when they touch that big ride cymbal, then the pitch might jump on my theremin. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's another weird, strange thing. It's like, you could be standing next to someone who stays very still next to you. And I discovered this when someone's dog, you know, a little tiny pit bull terrier thingy, you know, came up and then it was licking my leg while I was playing. And each time its tongue made contact with me, the pitch, it sounds like it's jumping. Oh. You know, like, but him, but him, but him. And, uh, you know, it's like, because, you know, suddenly. I've become a bigger piece of mass, but it's kind of interesting because the dog could be so right next to me, but if we're not making contact, you're not going to hear that, that sudden jump. Okay. And that's kind of an interesting thing that suddenly, you know, when we become, you know, one big attached mass, attached mass that it, you can hear this jump. And that's and crazy. It sounds like a jump, but it's just happening so fast. It's a, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So the, the instrument itself is actually a fairly new instrument, and it, so it's it's what, about a hundred years old. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so has the measuring dis- tool, and, and, and what you're listening to is just the, the change of the pitch or volume, giving you a measurement of what's happening around the antenna. <laughs> that, you know, that's crazy. 
but so the, the, the but the instrument itself is not old it's it's fairly new com- relatively speaking to other instruments yeah yeah it's a, it's 101 years old now wow and uh, yeah so it, it it's not um not something that has a let's say a, a tradition behind it right which is a good thing. you know it's not it's great that no one can tell you you're doing it right or wrong and the <laughs> and there's not one good way to work with it. It's just, it kind of depends what it is you're shooting for and what your vision is. And yeah, especially if... if patience, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially if this, you know, the physical makeup of somebody affects it, too. It, it's make, kind of hard to standardize uh, ways to play it if, if, if it's going to... You know, react differently because one person's bigger than the next. Yeah, well, you know, like over the you know long period of time, you I'm sure you've heard there are different types of techniques for all the other instruments, and mm-hmm. you know there are different techniques for uh, you know playing piano or playing guitar, and and with this, there's not really any. I think it's just not even necessary. That's a great thing to know that. There's not an established technique, and yeah. you have to question too. What is expression in making music? And to to be able to look at art without making comparisons. So it's kind of nice that it, that dealing with this instrument can pose some other questions about expression yeah. and to what's possible. You know, what what can you do with this instrument that you would not be able to do on any of the others? And and yeah, it's a, it's kind of nice that it, even though it's, you know, almost, you know, it's over a hundred years old. It's still very, very, um, it provokes a lot of forward thinking ideas. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Being that it's relatively new as far as instruments are concerned, has the design changed much over the hundred and one years that it's been around? Um. Yeah. Well. The instrument that Clara played, you know, because she um, she spent a lot of time with the inventor, and she took it, you know, very far um, as far as like you know coming from, um, you know, let's say the classical tradition, mm-hmm. you know, of, of using it in um, in a melodic way, using it as if it's like a vocal or stringed instrument, and she, and I believe instruments. Um, develop when there's a collaboration between um, the person who's building it together with the musician that has a vision of how to make some improvement um, or you know what's needed to be able to do this or that is that possible in having that rapport together so her instrument definitely is different from let's say one of the RCA models um, okay. that were semi-mass-produced at the time. I, I've tried restored ones and everything, and they're nowhere even as good as the small, basic Moog theremin. <laughs> really? Wow. You know, it, 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 it's, it, it takes... A, yeah, the, it's... <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. But, but um, you know, Bob Moog, his... Uh, he, his first passion was building theremins um, oh, really? before he built a keyboard synth. Oh, wow. And uh, I, there's, a, there's a kind of museum organization place uh, outside of Philadelphia called the EMIAP, and they have, it's beautiful, they have um, an instrument that Bob and his father built. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that, and you know and and in playing you know that instrument you know um it definitely doesn't even uh, it doesn't have the same sensitivity as his later ones um because he had the opportunity in the 70s to do some repair work on clara's instrument and that's when he first was introduced to her okay he knew of her already and you know admired her work and who else was out there to help fix her instrument? And yeah. he got a glimpse into the inventor's design. He got her input 
which was very important because without her input, how would you know how to calibrate the thing? Yeah, good and point. So from that point on, that had a really that that influenced the design of this later ceremony, and uh, and that's you know it um, that that really explains why uh, I've tried all the different models I know of at least so far out there, but the instruments that he's built are really. Um, their tops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Designed by Bob or really, you know, it comes with a lot of that, you know, wisdom and also the input that he received. Um, and so the sensitivity, and he also understood how to play it enough and understand what was necessary as far as response and how to make improvements, uh, you know, like uh, being able to build a theremin that has more octaves than Clara's instrument. You know, that's uh -huh. a later development as well. Now, was that something that you were involved in? Because I know that you'd worked with with Bob in in the uh, helping to test the, the Etherwave. Oh. <laughs> the Etherwave Pro. That's the that's the funky looking rocket ship looking style <laughs> of one. That, yeah, after he passed away, it was around that time they they, were, they weren't there weren't any more being produced. They, they weren't selling very well at that point yet, even though I know the demand is out there because a lot more people are playing and they really are craving stepping it up to what certainly is like the Bosendorfer or Steinway of theremins as far as sensitivity. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it would be like going from a, you know, and okay, let's say Kauai and up or, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly jumping on to something that, that that's like butter and has a lot more nuance to play with. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the, Makes and, sense. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that that model came about after I'd been touring heavily with the Etherbox model that looks like a big piece of furniture. Yeah. And it, I kept, you know, losing the legs in the back of cabs, and like, Bob, you sent me another set of legs, and like, oh. and, and you, know, the, you know, the legs got all wobbly from being assembled, disassembled, assembled, disassembled, you know, to break the thing down and put it back up again. Yeah. It just wasn't practical. It was great for, it, you know, keeping in one place and not moving around too much. Okay. And so, uh, so then finally, um, <clears throat> you know, I asked him, "Is it possible to make a more portable version of this that is meant for touring?" <laughs> and so that's when he, you know, thought of other ideas too. You know, um, well, there were things like uh, on my old instrument, I'd have to do, I'd have to spend time changing the sound settings if I went between uh, playing bass lines and a melodic line. Oh, and so, wow. you know, it had an effect musically playing with other people. Like, okay, I need an extra measure or two so I can reset my, you know, the knobs on my instrument so that oh, it, wow. so that I have the sound setting I want for when I'm playing bass and the response that I need and the volume and and so those ideas also went into the the pro model. So uh, mm -hmm. then it was just really fast that I could make the transition without having to twiddle a bunch of knobs <laughs> in between. I'm like, keep going. Okay, yeah. ready now. <laughs> just vamp a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm going to take a solo over there. Hang on, I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm going to go take a dump. No, just yeah. kidding. I'm just changing my studying. <laughs> Either way, I'll be back with you. I should call it taking a dump. I gotta go take a dump. Be right this, back. I, I like Turn it. Turn the knob. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. So, is it hard to transcribe music for the theremin? Because, and what I've I've heard of uh, is a lot of music that's uh, composed stri strictly for the theremin. But I've also heard you do some more standard pieces do you ever do i don't know pop rock music on the theremin and and, and how do you transcribe music f for the theremin well, it's like 
working with a voice. You know, a stringed instrument, you can jump between strings to, to, to do really big interval jumps and very quickly. Um, or a bowed instrument, you know, physically you have a way to go da 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 And with a theremin, it works very differently. So it, it's like working with a voice, except you have a wider octave range than the typical human voice. Okay. And, um, and so the, it's, yeah, I've made adaptations uh, um, for the theremin to play, and lots of other people have too, you know, whether it be, you know, taking jazz standards or an aria, um, you know, if something's written for voice, it usually lends itself very well to playing on the theremin. Okay. And, uh, and to, yeah, and Robin, I should send you some links. <laughs> There's a yes. lot of recordings. As soon as anybody says, I should send you some links, the answer is always yes, you should. <laughs> you don't even have to finish that sentence. Just yes, do it. <laughs> the great thing is that, you know, I, I have, uh, um, you know, quarter-inch cable outputs, and I can run this. And you know, people forget it is a synthesizer. A synthesizer is not necessarily a keyboarded instrument. This is before the keyboard synth was a theremin. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't even think of it like that. Yeah, it, because it was a pain in the ass to play, you know, and composers <laughs> were interested in the, in, in the synthesized sound. And finally, you know, people were, you know, came around and thought, hey, how, how can we harness this and put it in a format that's a lot more universal that, that most musicians understand, like a keyboard layout. Uh... And that's higher than you know, having the keyboard layout <laughs> to okay. control the sound <laughs> okay okay that makes that makes sense then all right so if i'm at the airport you know i don't say it's a theremin because i know they gonna say what is that i just say oh there's a synthesizer in here and it goes through the scanner okay fine <laughs> hey. okay that'll work synth, you know it looks exactly the same. <laughs> that's a great idea <laughs> <laughs> so so okay so it's a synthesizer so you can run effects through it then yeah i can run it through effects pedals and uh, um so that's a lot of fun i, I love using, using the effects pedals with it and it's a clean signal so also for recording you can go direct oh um, okay. yeah so it, it's it's really handy in that way you know there's a sound system great yeah <laughs> 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 but you know, I can imagine running or hearing you know chorus and and loops, loop pedals and harmonizers, octave pedals, things like that. Can you run it through a distortion? What does it? What does it yes. sound like? I have so much recorded stuff that's doing all of that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing! I I'm so used to just hearing that. Oh yeah, like to get distortion, um. You know, it's difficult because sometimes, you know, the the voice that's coming out of it might not have enough bite. So so I recommend to people, especially if they're using just the standard model, to run it through um, uh, something like a chorus mm -hmm. so that you have fighting pitches next to each other. That gives a lot more harmonics to grab off of. Okay. And then into a distortion pedal wow. to get more. Yeah. And the... <laughs> <laughs> I've got to hear that. I, I I would love to hear it, like almost like playing the guitar. You know, throw some some fuzz on there and a wah, and and you, you can. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can make some of the craziest freaking sounds I've ever heard. I'm sure. so, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'd mentioned losing legs on that one version. Is it is it difficult? Is it fragile? It, it's not fragile. I, I've always checked it under on the airplane, and I haven't had problems. You know, I okay. have, you know, pushing it up with some foam, and uh, you know, it, it's 
it's not it's not so easily breakable unless you I don't know dump a bunch of beer all over or set it on fire. <laughs> oh, that now yeah. that would be a show a flaming theremin. I know. <laughs> Go with all Jimi Hendrix on your theremin. <laughs> flaming sins. <Yeah. laughs> I think didn't uh, New Order do that at one point? I don't know. Maybe maybe it was uh, Neubauten. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I've seen that somewhere. So, I've got a, a well, crap. I've got so many other questions. This is just insane. But I, I asked a couple people that I, I know uh, who are really interested in theremins. One is a guest I had on the show who plays the theremin, and I mentioned that I was having you on the show, and he went nuts. I said, "All right, well, what, what, what do you want me to ask her then?" So, the guy's name is Nick Kizernis, and awesome awesome guy he wants to know uh what would you recommend to up-and-coming players about posture or standing sitting and moving to stay in tune oh yeah well if the goal is to stay in tune just do what works for you i mean you know like a, when, if someone's just beginning I, I tell them hey if it helps sit on a stool or lean against a wall behind you okay because it makes it a lot easier so then, then you just understand that the only movements that you have to deal with or be aware of or just, you know, what's happening with your arms and fingers. Okay. And so, yeah, it, so there's, the, the, it, you can be very creative with figuring out how to um, make yourself as still as possible. Like, yeah. don't have too many fingers. <laughs> yeah. Lower, lower your alcohol intake. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> But now he also wanted to know: Does the quality of the instrument affect how much your positioning and posture affect the sound? Um, it's it's not so much to do it because I could also stand with poor posture and be hunched over and contorted and still and still sound like me um, with how I do it. But it would just be a much more painful painful way to go about it. So and. <laughs> The best rule of thumb is uh, um, is just being very aware of uh, um, not using any muscles or energy that's not necessary for what you're doing because okay. you don't have to move much, and so you know it, it's you. So you you just have to um, not have to, but it just helps to be very aware of um, of. Uh, it's like conserving your energy and using a minimal amount and and checking, you know, to make sure that you're not straining your neck, not straining your arms, okay. because it's a tendency. This happens with any instrument, you know. If you, you know, when you can hear that it's not sounding the way that you want it to, it's very natural to have a physical reaction to that and to tense up. And uh, and that's uh, that's something that anyone can even have sitting at the computer and getting a stressful email, right. and suddenly they can tighten. And so to be very conscious and aware of of your your body and and how relaxed that you can remain with it is is the most important thing because you you can do a lot of damage if you're not paying attention. If people playing any instrument. Or you know any sport, if they're not paying attention, it's too easy to just play just to make it sound really good. But you don't want to make a compromise or sacrifice um, your tendons, or you know your. And so it's a good yeah. practice, even just maybe I don't know, like standing in front of the instrument and not doing anything except just standing still. Okay. Don't play anything. Stand in front of it and be aware of what it's like when you're not trying to play something. How still are you keeping the note when you're just standing there? Okay. Because I, I saw the video and you were showing how just breathing can can affect the instrument. Yeah, the movement of your chest. It also depends, too, and if you, I calibrate mine very tightly, so I make very tiny movements. But I, I find it's the it, for me it's a lot easier than to get around faster, and to you know I can reach much more intervals without the riskiness of involving bigger muscle groups. 
Okay. But I think, yeah, that's a really good idea of the stand still in front of it and just maybe set the volume so it's not blowing your ears up, <laughs> but just stand with both of your hands down and set the volume so it's not too loud to just stand there and then listen to the pitch as it's moving, if it does, when you're standing there. And to, then you'll have an idea of how much the rest of your body might be having an effect if you're trying to play it and using your hand. Oh, wow, okay. How many companies make theremins? And, and is theremins the multiple of theremin? <laughs> yeah, unless it's like theramine. <laughs> yeah, exactly, theramini. <laughs> Yeah, that's the pro. Um, but I, I don't know how many companies there are because there are many people building them, you know, as a hobby as well. Oh, and there are many different, you know, some people are building, um, you know, more digital based instruments or, or um, yeah, the, it, there are just many types <laughs> that are out there. <laughs> Do you have to have uh, some kind of musical literacy to to play? And, and what I mean by that is, like you know, you can't just jump on a piano and and sound good. You you, you can you can play. Well, what some... is sounding good? It, I think <laughs> it depends on like what what you know to not have any expectations when you come up to it. Okay. Or any instrument. And just approach it and observe what's happening as you work with it. But, but I think you you don't need to have experience. You don't, if you if you have a vision for something, then that's a really great thing. Like ah, and sometimes to also come to the realization of like, wow, it doesn't work for me for the thing that I envision, and that's fine too. Oh, <laughs> Not that's a good point. Be a gymnast, you know, <laughs> like like. I can't pick up a fucking piccolo and do on the piccolo what I was able to do with a theremin. You right. know, it, it, it just depends what it is that your aim is. If the aim is like, there's this beautiful piece of music I want to play. Um, there are plenty of pieces that, no, it doesn't work on theremin. I still play piano. Yeah. And there are pieces that you're not going to do on the theremin with the piano. And so, and it, but it, it, it's a really great, um, it, it's a humbling instrument. And uh, I consider myself a lifetime beginner with it. You're always a beginner with any instrument if you're right. really open to knowing that, that you can never possibly know what all is possible with it. When you when you have no expectations and stay completely open to inspiration. Ah, oh, okay. That that's a great way to look at it because it's to me it, it's it's almost in, intimidating, I guess, to to see somebody playing it just because you, you know I'm, I mean I know a lot like any other instrument, you, your two hands are doing different things, but. Not well, all of... Big shift driving a car is you know using involve you know, playing drums involves all of your limbs to yeah. do. And, well, I can't do I that think, either. I can drive a stick though. But I think the intimidation it it, it it I think sometimes the roots of it is just you know it, it it can be hard to do anything or even attempt something. I know in my case if if I'm making comparison especially value, com you know, value comparison. Yeah. And so it, what's good is a, a good idea I find is not to make comparisons and just because that's tied in with expectations too. It's like there should never be this expectation of how it should sound, how, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a real, um, I think the, there's a special thing about approaching this instrument that, that because it's so difficult to uh, understand at first how sensitive it is, yeah. even though the only thing that you're changing is pitch and volume with your hands in the air. That's it. 
<laughs> but it, it, it can be kind of a mind trip into um, understanding yourself and and the and what you know what is it that's that you're expecting what's bothering you with it or or you know to be at peace with what you're doing with it and to and not compare or think i need to have more progress but it but to just enjoy um being with the thing and just to take it for what it is and and to, you know explore around and to, um because it, it it also it doesn't need to be treated in in a way that you know it's treated as if it's an instrument you can only play melodies on or uh, it, it can be used in so many different ways uh, I think it could be a really great uh, tool for uh, focusing, uh, you know, uh, mindfulness kind of a meditation dealing with the thing without the object in mind of uh, making music, let's say, but just to, you know, having a, uh, a mindfulness of, of what it is that you are changing as you're moving. Oh, okay. should I make very slow movements and what happens next? And just uh, using the, yeah, taking the opportunity to, <laughs> To be very in tune with your own body and what it's doing, and using your ears um, to uh, as the the way to hear the response, uh, I guess. <laughs> Is it a, an expensive instrument to get into? Because I know there's different levels of guitars and pianos, like we we're talking about. Not at all. They, they're you know they're really super cheap models. I think they're maybe like you know like a hundred bucks or whatever. It depends what it is you want to do with it too. I mean, if you're yeah. wanting to play melodically, then you, I you know or have more uh, control. I I always recommend the there's the Moog Basic Easterways, and it's like it's like about I don't know three four hundred dollars. Okay. It's like buying a trick guitar. So it's not, and you yeah. can find them used online because people buy them and get sick of them <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's it's very possible to find one really cheap you know cheaper okay. than the new price and they 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 don't break yeah not easily you know it's a it's it's just that it you know like anything else like the, the instruments i've acquired like oh, not really my thing and then just okay i hope it goes out there so much yeah. wants to Check it out. Yeah. <laughs> like there's plenty of fish in the pond. <laughs> I let you go. <laughs> you don't like me. You know, it's like it's like when someone doesn't love you back. You know, it can be that way with instruments too. When you've got expectations, then you don't feel like the instrument's loving you back. And it's like you know, but instruments never abuse you. You know. <laughs> That's a good point. It's all in your head. <laughs> I saw your problem that, with yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that's such an asshole. You do it's always attitude. Yeah. Cooperate. <laughs> me. I always have to listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> I always have to like, you know, compromise for it. The guitar never does what I want to do. Well, that's actually true. I get my guitar and it never does what I actually want it to do. I just make a bunch of <laughs> shitty noise with it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if I could just play with feedback all day long, I'd be happy. Well, that's a great idea, playing with feedback and then running feedback through pedals and effects. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd love doing that kind of crap. I, I mean, if I could listen to Neil Young's Ark or Smashing Pumpkins song Drown with that weird, crazy guitar solo and feedback all at the end, that that's, I'd be set. You have actually played with some pretty amazing people here, too. I'm looking at this list here. Um, I mean, David Byrne, Yoko Ono, uh, Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. That's just crazy stuff. I, I, I mean, Yoko Ono I, and, and David Byrne, I could definitely see thinking, this is a part I need a theremin for. But how many times do you get, get called in to do theremin work? Is, is it something that, that there's... Uh, there's a lot of call for? Well, the, I, I think it's not even about the theremin itself. I mean, the, the thing that I, that I was doing with Yoko, I was actually um, doing a cellist's part. Oh, wow. <laughs> I to the gig because he was on the album, and then it's like, oh, but, you know, um, but Sean and Yuka, who were music directing it, they're like, oh, wait, we ask Pamela and and, um, and I said, it just depends what's being called upon and um you know it's 
But also sometimes people ask, what style do you play? And it's like, I don't know. I, I guess the best way to describe it is that um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not monogamistic with the genre. <laughs> very promiscuous with <laughs> what type of style to play and who I play with. No, not like doing anything with them, but I'm talking about music. Right, right. And, and there's a full, uh, there's a full freedom for that, that, you know, doing things many different ways and nobody gets injured. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> These things are really, you know, sonically painful or whatever, but you know, <laughs> people can flush it. <laughs> You know, there's the, I call it ear condoms. You know, putting in the ear plug thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you also appeared on Saturday Night Live. So yes. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I, it, you know they notoriously pull all their stuff off of YouTube and streaming services and all. So it, it's hard to find clips. What What were you doing on Saturday Night Live? Just playing with the band, you know, like in between before it went to the commercials, you know. I can't oh, remember cool. the name of the or whatever, but it, like they're just, yeah, just, uh, you know, playing these little, uh, you know, as if treating it vocally. And oh, was, that, <laughs> is, was it just a one time deal or was it, uh, did it happen yeah. on a few kids? Oh, wow. One time, and it, it was. Um, that was the that was the gig that pretty much it's like oh great I got a flight to New York from LA and I was like I'm moving to New York perfect. Uh, <laughs> man. I got to New York like at that time like oh good timing. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up in Austria? Mm. I was playing at a festival here in 2005 and I met um I met someone there, and we fell in love, and oh. uh, and then it's a lot of this, you know, trying to see each other back and forth from a long distance, and and then finally, um, um, then it was like, well, I'm ready for a change, and we thought, what if we try living together here in Vienna? And um, he helped me with paperwork to move here. Wow. <laughs> I'll leave it as Oh, you got yeah. Especially the arrangement or anything, but we're really good friends now. Um, our kids play together. Oh, that's awesome. And so, yeah, yeah, and so I, I just thought, well, I'm gonna give it a shot and see what it's like living here. Hey, if you and can do it, man, why not? Yeah, yeah. You only live once. Exactly. <laughs> now, do and your kids? I miss it like crazy, so I always go back. <laughs> Oh, do your kids play the theremin at all? Do Do you let them in on it? Have they um, tried it? Yeah, he understands it, and he's noodled around with it and stuff. But he, you know, he, it's more if I hear him singing around the house, he's got this great vibrato. <laughs> it's like I'm sure you know he grew up hearing you know from inside the womb. I think I, the last gig I played was a week before he was born. So wow. I mean, you heard an earload of many different styles of music in the room. Wow. And kicked me loud, too. <laughs> Knock it off. <laughs> so he, he, he understands, you know, what's going on with how it's working, you know. Okay. Like yeah, yeah. I'm hoping, though, that, you know, when I'm at gigs and it's like, it, I've explained the thing like a million times now, like, I just give him a fiber and like, okay, you explain it to everyone. I'm going to go hide backstage now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, this has been a blast. I, I think I've learned quite a bit about this instrument. It's just that it was a complete mystery to me before. So I'm really glad I've been able to chat with you about this. Oh, I'm so glad that you asked me and, uh, and your enthusiasm too. Thank you so much for <laughs> interviewing me. <laughs> oh, it is my pleasure. And I, I was thinking about this. Well, here's here's kind of how it started. Okay, I had this guy, that guy Nick Kazernis, on the show, and uh, he's he's got an album that just came out, and he pl- he also plays in this band called the Mulch Men. And they nice name the Mulch Men. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So they do this, um, they play this kind of like surf rockabilly type of music, and but he also pulls out the theremin on stage, and he'll play the theremin 
during some of this surf music and all. And he has a really cool job with it. It's really good. In fact, check it out on YouTube. Um, he plays, I don't remember, it's, I think it's um, Wipeout 3000 or something. It's like a, it's a takeoff on, on, the, so on, on the old surf track Wipeout. And he adds a theremin to it and he just goes really, he goes nuts with it. It's, it's really cool to watch. And um, so I was asking him about how, how he got into playing the theremin and all. And he's like, oh, I'm just an amateur. He's, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot of fun, but, you know, it, it's, it's this really interesting instrument. But I don't, I don't really know a whole lot about it. I mean, the guy's been playing it for years now. And, and in the <laughs> interview, he's like... Something with it. You know, he had a vision for what to do with it, and he's doing it. That's yeah. not amateur. Having a vision is... <laughs> having a vision <laughs> exactly exactly so so i i told him that that the instrument fascinates me and i was thinking about doing like um every once in a while i'll ha I'll, I'll do these round table episodes where I'll, I'll have a few past guests on and we'll discuss something completely not uh involving the music like uh for example i had um I had uh, uh, Jordan Zadarosny from Blinker the Star and Kelly Scott from Failure on. They're like really good friends. They've known each other for years. They were both on on the same show. And Jordan came back on a few weeks later. And instead of talking about his music, we talked about David Lee Roth era Van Halen for an hour and a half. <laughs> and then Kelly came back on later and we just talked about mixed martial arts. And because I don't know anything about that either. Um, and I had... Aaron Lazar on from the Giraffes and and uh, uh, Jason Thompson from Vast Robot Armies got them together and we did a show on the best uh, uh, cover songs that were better than the originals. So I'll do episodes like that where it's not focused on the guest's music. And I started thinking about talking to Nick about it. I, said, I would love to do an episode on the just the theremin. You know, the history of it, interesting theremin music, um, you know, and things like that, and, and and he was like, "That'd be great." So, I, I I started thinking about that immediately after I had Nick on. I had uh, Dana Schechter on, and Dana. <laughs> yeah, so I was telling her I had, I had such a great time chatting with her. I invited her to come back on and do one of those types of shows where it's one where we're not talking about her music; we're just talking about some other topic. And I mentioned the Theremin show, and she's like, "You got to get Pamela Stickney on." I, okay, tell me about it. <laughs> she's like, "Oh, she's like this, this amazing Theremin virtuoso. She's fantastic, and she's hilarious. You love her." I'm like, "I'm sold." And she's like, "All right, I'll." So I re that's and I reached out to you, and uh, if you're ever if you're interested in doing another episode, either on something completely different, or if you want to discuss, do a little round table about the theremin and just weird shit having to do with the theremin, you know, I would love to have you back on and do another episode. Oh, I'd be thrilled to be back on. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So let's definitely let's stay in touch. On, um, I like talking about all sorts of weird stuff. I can tell you. Oh, oh my god. I was it. Remember, I had written something in there like about the gonna ring ya. Yes, that was hilarious. <laughs> this is a side topic, but uh, the weird conversations that happen backstage. So oh. there was a, there was a fan that I was like, you know, uh, sitting in some shows with, and and the singer was telling me about like, yeah, you know, one time, I was like, it was really terrible. I got gonorrhea. And That's terrible. <laughs> And he had to, you know, the nurse told him, like, yeah, you got to contact all of the people you've been with the past six months because it's really serious and it could do a lot of, you know, harm, uh, you know, to their system. And, yeah. And so then he's like, oh, man, I got to make these calls. This is so terrible. And he thought, what if there was this service, you know, that's like a pre recorded message, like, hello, plug in the name. This is a call to let you know that so and so you know, has, has gonorrhea. <laughs> and you can call it, the service would be called gonorrhea. <laughs> that, is, that is brilliant. I love it. Gonorrhea. <laughs> I love it. Oh, so you can, you know, so if you, you know what? Okay, so on that line, I, I think I heard that, I think my daughter said something like this, didn't She's like, There's, there should be one, uh, a kind of a, a phone service where if you're feeling bad, you call them up, 
and it, it's calling calling oats. You just call up, and then it just loops in some Hall and Oats. It makes you feel better. Call and oats. You just call and oats. <laughs> so, I'll, all right, so so uh, on that vein, I guess I had a while back now. I had a, a chef on the show. Uh, her name is uh, Selena Teo. She's freaking awesome. If you're ever in Kansas City, go to the Belfry because it, it's just an amazing place. She's got uh, it's a restaurant oh. lounge, and she's got uh, the, uh, this amazing bar. It takes 350 whiskeys, 250 of them are bourbon. It's just incredible. Well, she's been on Iron Chef America, Top Chef Masters. Wow. But she's the coolest person. So we did it. We did a couple shows, uh, one with her and then one where I put a Spotify playlist together and she would match bourbons to the songs in the playlist. <laughs> it's just awesome. But before I got her on, we were contacting uh, and, and just trying to arrange it through text messages so she was asking what when i record so i said i have a day job i I don't like to record on the weekends um it's always on weekdays and i send it to her and i didn't spell check it or before i i sent it and i looked and i don't know why but my text auto corrected to i don't record on the weekends it's anal on the weekdays. <laughs> I only do anal on the weekdays. I only do Sorry. anal on the weekdays. <laughs> and this is literally the first thing I ever sent to her in my life. It's the first text I've ever sent to her. And oh my God. It, it, like, um, it took like, like two minutes later, I looked down and I realized, I read the text and I'm like, oh shit. So I replied to her. I said, I always record on the weekdays. I said, anal is always on the weekends. So I figured, you know, at this, at this point, I got nothing to lose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this even funnier. And, and she just responded with the crying, laughing emoji. And she said, yeah, let's, let's keep it on the weekdays. <laughs> So, but she's been she's been really cool, and I stay in touch with her. And 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 uh, we're actually going to hopefully be doing another episode of uh, music and bourbon. So, so I wow. really enjoyed chatting with you. So, if you're ever interested in coming back on and doing another episode, let's stay in touch and throw some ideas out, and and let's do another one. Oh yeah, that would be fun. That would be kind of fun to get like a a group of like four totally different people from different angles like <laughs> yeah absolutely we just have to figure out what oh we want God. to talk about because i've oh my gosh that's just come naturally i think like <laughs> I've got a... we just have to the next the next event to happen you know like a fucking asteroid next like who oh. knows like like you know it, when people say oh it can't get worse it's like oh yeah <laughs> don't don't tempt it. Things to laugh about at this point. Like we we all deserve to have a little bit of recreation in between. Um, you know, knowing the weight of what's what's in our faces right now. Yeah, like it, it's possible to laugh here and there. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. I I promise I'll let you go now and and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, and thanks again for having me. My pleasure. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Call notes. 